Hello, it's Keith here, and today we're going to be looking at getting Hello World running on the TIE 99. Now that is of course the home computer based on the TMS 9900, and we're going to be looking at today the full procedure for creating a Hello World example. We're going to be looking at the code to get the graphics to the screen, uh, the Hello World printing routine I use, and also how to compile a cartridge and then run it on an emulator. So hopefully uh, if you're getting started and you don't want to use the scripts I've written to compile things, you can learn how to create something of your own that will compile as well. Okay, well let's go over to today's source code and let's have a look. So we're going to be doing two versions today, the simple Hello World, which is the first version, and then a Hello World with some monitor tools, and the monitor tools simulate a um, register dump, and also show the contents of an area of memory, and I use these for getting started with a system when I'm still trying to learn how it works, you know, sometimes I'm trying to test something like reading in a register or from memory or something, and I'm not sure how it works, or I need to see how something like the workspaces are filled out, and I want to dump part of the memory. So those are quite handy for me, and they're based on the initial code we'll see in the Hello World example. So let's fire the example up and see what happens. Okay, so here's classic 99 starting up. If I just move this into frame here, and if I just press 2 and then 2 again, 2 loads the program on the cartridge. We're using a cartridge because that's the easiest way of getting something started. And today's example is showing Hello World twice on two separate lines. So there we go. Okay, so let's have a look at the code that's doing this today. Now, the first thing we've got in our code definition here is we're creating a symbol called cursor X, and we're pointing that to memory address 8320. Now, the 8300 range is the 256 bytes of system memory, so we're using one of these bytes for an X position. We're just using a single byte. Now, we're not using a Y position, and I'll explain why later on. That, that comes into our new line routine. That's what uses this. Okay. Next, we've got a header for our cartridge here. So we've got some lines that are pretty standard for our cartridge, and these are the ones I use in all of my examples. So first of all, we've got this command called padding off. Well, what does this mean? Well, the TMS9900 is a 16-bit processor, of course, and that means that the commands need to be even aligned. So if we had a single byte, in between two of these commands, then they would become odd aligned and that would cause a crash, and that would be a bad thing. So what we do to avoid that is we have to pad out that single byte with an extra zero. Now, that would occur if padding was set to on, but I've set it to off, and the reason I've done that is it was causing problems with some parts of the code here and in some of the other examples, and so for consistency with what I was more used to on the 8-bit systems, I turn padding off and I take responsibility for aligning the code myself, and you can see I've done that here. I've put in a line 2, which will even align after this code, and that will make sure this example works no matter what's the length of the code. Now, if I take this align command out here and I run again, well, it's compiled, but when our program starts, well, it doesn't work anymore. And the reason for that is that the code has no longer become even aligned. Now, I can actually fix this in a quirky way if I add an extra exclamation mark here, because now, by coincidence, so to speak, um, we are even byte aligned again. And now the code works just fine with a second exclamation mark, but um, that's not really the right way of doing things. So we could put in a line there, or we've got to manually make sure like in that way, you know, putting an extra zero byte here or something, that it's aligned. Or we could turn the padding back on. But as I say, that was causing problems for this. And some of the other examples with regards to bitmap graphics, it wasn't so convenient. So I'm turning padding off, but that does mean we need to be a little bit careful. Okay. Now our cartridge starts at memory address 6000 in hexadecimal here. And then we've got a fixed pair of bytes here for the header. That's just to define the cartridge. Got a couple of zero bytes here, of zero words rather. And then we've got a pointer to the first um, program definition within the cartridge. Now the cartridge in theory can have multiple programs, but we're never gonna do that. So we've just got a single one. We're defining this as being the only program here. And we are then defining a pointer to the start of our code, which is here. So this is what we'll run when the user selects that cartridge program. We then got a length of the label of the cartridge here, and mine is learnasm.net. And if I just change this to learn DSM for some reason, and I run again, I'm just skip past this, you can see it now says learn DSM.net. So this is being taken from here, and the program start is what occurs when I press F2 here. So that's our sort of fixed cartridge header, and that will be a good starting point for our program. It's nice and easy to build a cartridge, so that's what I try and do where the system allows it. 
Okay, so the first thing we're doing when our program starts is we're turning off interrupts, we don't need them. And then we need to define our workspace registers. Now the workspace registers are R0 to R15 because they actually use this piece of memory, remember. So we're pointing that to another area within the 8300 to 83FF range, because if you remember I was using 8320 for the X position. So I'm using 83CO and that needs 32 bytes of memory for the 16-bit 16, 16 registers there. So that's what I'm using there. Now, we've now got everything ready to start doing some programming. So the program now starts off with getting the Hello World onto the screen. Now, the first thing we're doing here is we're selecting the right address for the video memory. Now, the way the screen's set up when the machine turns on, each byte of video memory is a tile from memory address zero onwards, and each of those tiles is effectively a character. So what we need to do is we need to define the system that we're going to be able to write to the first character visible on the screen. So what we need to do is we need to select to write to memory address zero effectively here. That's actually a mistake there, that should be zero. I was writing to 20, but I've changed it. Okay, so we're gonna to write to memory address zero, but we're actually writing the value hexadecimal 4,000 here. And the reason for that is we need to add the bit six set to one here to tell the video hardware that we want to be able to write to VRAM if we didn't set that. If we set that to zero, we would actually be reading from VRAM. So I've had to set that to a one there. And that means effectively we add hexadecimal 4,000 to the memory address we want to write to. Now we've got that there, but we've actually swapped it around because we, we want to write the value 4000, but we've loaded in 0040 here into R0. And that's because we need to write the low byte, this 00, zero part first, so we write the low byte here, we then swap the two parts around and then we write the high byte here. Now the alternative would have been to have an extra swap command just here and put these the other way around like this. Just like that. So that still works just fine. Now, the thing is of course, this is a memory address that we're defining as the starting write address for our characters. So if I put a different value in here, for example, if I put in a one here, well, we're gonna start some way down the screen now. You see, we're all the way down here. And then if I put in a four here, or five even, my typo there, uh, we're gonna start five characters from the left-hand side, which is to see just there. So we effectively, this is kind of like our locate command, and we could define a locate command to do this for us. Now, you, you sort of start to realize that if we add the right value, we'll move down the screen. And if we add a small value, we'll move across the screen. Now the screen is 32 tiles wide. So for every 32 or hexadecimal 20, we add to this value, we'll move one line down. And that's why originally this said 0020 here, because at one point we were starting from the second line down the screen, but there's no need to do that. So that's what we're doing there. Now, 8CO2 is the VDP control port, and this is what's used to define screen settings and also select memory addresses for reading and writing. So we're selecting a memory address for writing here by writing these two bytes to this port, and it's that four just here at the top byte that defines that we're writing here, and an eight would define a um, register, a, a video register for mode settings and things, and a zero would define reading, okay? Now, what we're doing next is we're clearing the X position. Now, the X position is used for our, by our new line routine to move down a line. Okay, so here's our examples. We're loading in the string for Hello World, which you can see just here. All of my tutorials use byte 255 ending symbols. Some most I know would use a zero, but I've come to use 255 across all my tutorials, so I'm keeping that consistent here. And we've got a print and string routine, which will print the string. And we've got a new line routine, which will move us down the line. And that's gonna be important for our monitor routine, which needs that function. Okay, let's have a look at the routines that we're using to print characters, because that's kind of the um, linchpin for all of this code. Okay, now before we go any further, I do want to discuss the default character map, because we're gonna be using that default character map, and there's a bit of a gotcha in it. Let's go over to our example here. So here is the character map. Now you can see the first 32 characters are random bits of garbage. Well, we don't care about those because those are never visible anyway. And then we've got our standard ASCII characters here. We've got our standard ASCII characters here. And then we have nothing. Uh, you'll see that there's no lowercase characters defined. So um, that's gonna be a, a slight problem for us. And we're gonna see that in our code because we're gonna have to work around the lack of those characters. 
So that's what we're going to be doing here. Now, what we're doing here with this print chart is we're going to print character R0, the top byte of that word, to the screen. So the first thing we're doing is we're comparing to 96 because the lowercase would be 96 onwards. Now, if it's less than 96, then the character's going to be just fine for us to print as int because it's uppercase. So we're going to carry on there. But if it's not, then we're effectively subtracting 32. Now, we're doing that. But there's no subtract immediate, so we're using an add immediate here. And we're effectively converting lowercase to uppercase. And I'll show you what happens if we don't do that in just a moment. Now, when we want to print a character, we have effectively just set the VRAM to that byte now. Now, we've selected our screen address up here, and every consecutive write to the data port at 8C00 will put a byte in the next position, effectively along the screen, but in VRAM. So we're just moving the byte from our zero now into 8C00, and that will draw the character to the screen. Then the next thing we do is we're just increasing cursor X to note that we've printed an extra character along the screen. Now, if I just run this here, you will see Hello world here. If I, of course, just change this and I put an extra right in for some reason like that. Well, now you can see each letter has been duplicated. A bit weird there. But uh, just, just making the point that it, it's automatically incrementing along and all we need to do is write bytes to the screen there. Now, where's our hello world message? You'll see this is upper and lower case. And we've had to deal with that with these lines here. Now, if I take these out, well, let's see what happens. Oh dear, our letters are missing because, as I say, there's no lowercase characters defined. So that's why we've had to put this check in to fix those lowercase characters and convert them to uppercase. We've got a print string routine here. Now this is going to use our print char routine to print the characters to the screen. It just keeps running print char until it finds a character 255. As I say, it would be more efficient to use a character 0, but as I say, I, I use the same thing on all of my tutorials just to keep them consistent. OK, so that's our print string, very simple, just reading in repeatedly characters from R1 and then printing them using the print char routine. How about our new line routine? Well, in this case, what I've done is um, I'm effectively printing spaces until we move along the screen and start a new line. Now, each line is 32 characters, and every time we've printed a character, we've counted the cursor X. Now, my example here will actually be wrong because um, it doesn't know the correct starting point of the screen. Uh, because I was five characters in, it won't realize that. We could have fixed that by loading a five in here, but we haven't done that. So I'll just correct that there so we've got our default starting point. So this is how our new line routine works. We load in the current X position, what position our character is on the screen, and then we keep printing spaces until we get to the character 31 here, which is the end of the screen. And then we know we're ready to start printing the next line of the screen. So we just keep repeating here, effectively writing zeros to 8C00, the data port, printing spaces effectively, because character zero is space. And then when we're finished, we just update cursor X to a new, which is going to be effectively zero now. And then we just return. So that's how we do our new line here. So there we go. And that's all there is to getting the two hello worlds on the screen with the new line in between them. And of course, if I put a second new line in here, well, you'll see now that there's two spaces between them like that. So there we go. So that's the basic example code here. And we're then we can use that and extend it to a hello world with monitor. Now, I'm not going to discuss how the monitor works because it's complicated and it's not the point I'm trying to make. You can see here we've got all the basic same code here. There's just one extra addition of this print chart R3, which will print the character in R3 to the screen as a character. It's just an alternate version that the monitor needed. So that's there. And the monitor needs some memory of its own for a second workspace. So we're just defining that up here. Now, if we just run this, we'll just see what the monitor tools offer to us. They offer two things. They can show us the entire contents of the registers. Um, you can see them all just here. And it can dump an area of memory. You can see we've dumped 8300 just here. Now, how do we do that? Well, we've got two new commands we can call. We can branch with workspace to this monitor, and that will show the registers. Or we can we use branch and link to RAM dump, which will dump an area of memory. And the area of memory is the memory address specified here. And here is the number of bytes. So if I change this to 0a, and I change this to 8301, and I run again, well, 
Well, now you can see we've done more bytes of memory here from 8301. And I say these are very helpful for me just getting started when I'm trying to learn things. So I wanted to make them available to you in this simple example. So there we go. So we've now got a program that we can compile. We now need to just look at how we're actually building this program. Now I use the assembler Mac OS, which is ASW and we are compiling it with this script here. This is a batch file. Now there's various parameters here that we're specifying and I'm just gonna briefly go through each one and explain what it means. So first of all, this percent one, this is a batch file command and this will effectively be the file like hello world.asm that we're compiling. We then specify the processor type because ASW Mac OS supports lots of processors. We're using TMS 9900. We then specify to output a listing file and a listing file is a text file that shows what all of the source commands compiled to as bytes. And it's quite handy when things start going wrong, like if you've got the padding problems or if um, sometimes there's some optimization going on you don't know about. Uh, it's not gonna be something you need if you're starting out, but if your assembler supports it, I recommend you output one because it's gonna be a help if you have problems. Now I'm defining a symbol called build T99. This command here is the equivalent of putting build T99 EQU1 or something like that within our code. And I do this because my tutorials are multi-platform and some processors have multiple systems I'm building for. At the moment this example just works on the TIE 99 but for future proofing I'm defining that but you don't need to for today's examples. And then finally we're defining an output file and we're building prog.build. Now AWSW doesn't output directly to a binary file this is a sort of intermediary file format so we need to convert it. So we're using p to bin which will convert that build file into a binary file and that's what we want. So this is just a sort of raw byte output of the assembly source code compiled with no tricks and cleverness. It's really, really dumb. And that's what we need to build a cartridge. So this P2Bin is converting the intermediary build file here into a binary file. And that's now a ROM cartridge that our emulator can run. I'm using classic 99. We just specify that we want to run a ROM file on the command line and the name of the output file from P2Bin here and that will be ready for us to run and that's all there is to it. So that's how we've been able to get our program running on the emulator today. So there we go, we've looked at all of the stages of compiling and running a program there. That's how I got my Hello World and all of my examples really working. So hopefully this will help you out if you're looking to start programming. I mean, of course, uh, if you want, you can get download all the source codes and you might want to take the Hello World example I've done here and then start building it into something of your own. That's really what it's there for. So please go ahead to my website if you want to and get the source code. Of course, the build scripts that I use for my tutorials are available as well. So feel free to get those as well if you would like to. I hope you found this interesting today. If you have, please like and subscribe. We're going to be doing more tutorials going forwards on the um, TIE 99. We're going to be looking at some graphics and sound and reading the keyboard. So hopefully that'll be interesting to you as well. But whatever you do, I hope you enjoy your programming and the TIE 99. Thanks for watching today and goodbye.